lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? We're back. Yeah, we're, we're back. <laughs> this is yeah. We've we've missed a couple. Um, yeah. I was really hoping that I would get to change that opener a little bit and say broadcasting on location in the Crescent City or something. You know. <laughs> ah, yeah, or, yeah. Um, but I didn't get to make that trip. <laughs> no. <Nope. laughs> um, so yeah, we missed an episode because uh, I was in. Um, Technically Sparks. Oh, is that where it was at? Yeah, yeah. Technically Sparks for the uh, Libertarian Convention. Um, and I brought back a bunch of nice memories and COVID. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like the last person in North America to get COVID, which really, really upsets me because I feel like I was in the home stretch, man. Like yeah. if I well, could have just, I, I tripped in the home stretch. If I could have made it just a few more months, I would have gotten through this whole thing without ever getting COVID. And that would have well, been sweet. The, the, the good thing is, the good news is, is you got the weak version. Like, I mean, it's definitely the watered down COVID. It ain't the COVID of 2019 to 2020. I, I am not 100% convinced that it, my experience wouldn't have been pretty similar then. It may would have been. I, I don't know, though. Um, you know, if only they had just kept up that mask mandate on planes. Oh, yeah, that's because that was the problem. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, or indoors, because, you know, I spent a lot of time in that convention. Yeah. It's like, you, it just, I know you're being facetious. Yeah, here, this is tongue in cheek. But, but <laughs> you really think a bunch of libertarians would have obeyed a mask mandate had it had been in place? I, I actually do kind of hold the, um, the Nugget Casino Resort. Uh, responsible though, yeah. Um, it may have happened anyway, yeah. but I think that the real problem was their elevator setup. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I they so for some reason, uh, their stairwells are there's like a hard block between the downstairs area, like the casino and resort and convention center area, yeah. and the rooms. Oh really? Yeah. So. There were certainly issues. They had like six elevators in each tower, and maybe half of them were running at any one time because that's how that's elevators, how elevators work. work. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, as convention things ended, um, there would be these huge queues to get into the ele- to pack into an elevator. Yeah. Um, and then stop at every floor because you couldn't get there any other way. Yeah, there was no walk uh, option. No, there was no walk option. I um one of the like one of the first mornings I was there, I got tired of waiting for the elevator because it was about time for the convention to start. So I guess people were, you know, on the move. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I was on the 10th floor and I'm like, you know, I'm in good shape. I like to walk. I'm taking the damn stairs. Yeah. Absolutely. And so I got in the stairwell and I went down and I hit a wall at the, at the third floor, like literally hit a wall, <laughs> literally like the, a wall. The, the, the stairs ended at the third floor. So I had to get out of the stairwell, yeah. go back and wait uh, for the elevator to go down one more floor. Oh, man. I would have been loving it. And, uh, yeah, I was complaining about it, and somebody else said well, uh, that they had, I mean, there was an emergency exit. Yeah. Because um, I, I was like, my first thought was like, well, what happens if there's a fire yeah, <laughs> or right. something? Um, and somebody told me that they had taken the emergency exit because they'd run into that same problem, and it delivered them out onto the street. You couldn't get back <laughs> into the hotel from there. <laughs> So, oh, that's I'm, great. Yeah, I'm glad that I didn't do that either. But it was it was really annoying. And there, I spent a lot of time packed into elevators with a bunch of other people. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that that is probably the most likely well, place where I spent enough time sharing air with somebody to have picked it up. Well, definitely a lot of people picked it up at the convention. I, yeah. Just from what I saw online and the different groups I'm in and whatnot. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I um, So at the uh, at the comedy show... Um, Dave Smith and Robbie the Fire and oh, there's some guy that that opened for the two of them whose name I forget now. He was good too. Yeah. Um, anyway, question came up from one of them. I can't remember if it was Robbie or Dave. I think it was Dave though that asked the room full of people, 300 and some people roughly, yeah. um, who finally broke down and got the, got the, the vaccine. Yeah. And nobody raised their hand. Wow. <laughs> now, I think that there are probably a few people in there that got the Just vaccine. Just did, didn't want to admit yeah. it. Yeah. Because, um, I mean, it, it's there were some places where it was really hard to live a life without oh, having yeah. done that. And also, if you were uh, scared and had um, 
people like especially at the beginning of this yeah um when the when the vaccines first came out and there were all those promises about what it would do yeah i can i wouldn't fault anybody for going out there and and doing it well i know quite a Um, few people that got it at the beginning just because they they thought it would help protect people around them yeah because that was the pitch i mean they they had reason to believe that it wasn't they didn't just make well it was just made up but it wasn't made up by the people who went and got it (laughs) yeah yeah um so i i would I'd be as a little surprised if there was nobody. Actually, the the one person that I saw raise their hand was somebody who was staff at that. Venue. Oh yeah, all right. <laughs> um, and that was the only hand that raised in the whole room. Wow. Uh, so I doubt that that's true, but I'm I'm confident that say... a majority of those people didn't get the. Yeah. <laughs> the oh shot. yeah. Absolutely. Um, I know that I didn't. Yeah. Uh, so anyway. Um, I don't know. It was, it was a fun time. I, I would have recorded on my own at, since then, except that I was coughing so much the last few days that I couldn't. Yeah. I mean, I would have had to pause the recording every three minutes. That would have driven me crazy. <laughs> all right. Uh, coughing fits. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but it was all, you know, it was nice. It was a fun okay. time. And I, I met some cool people and I had some good conversations because you do. Oh, yeah. Um, I got you're... to see uh, Ron Paul speak in person for the first time. That was kind of neat. Like, oh, yeah. I hate I missed that, and I really yeah. would have enjoyed that. It was uh, you might not have enjoyed it as much as you think, yeah. because the uh, the sound in the room where that event took place was not very good. They uh, had yeah. like really poor amplification, and um, that's yeah, a shame. Was, it was hard to hear. Anybody. They should have just gave him a bullhorn and put him up there. <laughs> Turn off the PA system and gave him a bullhorn. It might have been more effective. <laughs> oh. Um. But yeah, this, but a lots uh, a lots happened since then, and we may as well actually start with my flight out there because oh, yeah. um, that that was the day after the Uvalde. Oh yeah, event. yeah, yeah. Uh, and which I didn't even know much about it at that time because it I had, had just been happened. yeah, it had just happened, and I'd been busy getting ready to leave, so I hadn't been watching any news or or listening to anything. Yeah. So. Um, I got into a really interesting discussion with a girl who had just finished law school uh, on my flight from DFW to uh, to Reno. Yeah, and and this was like a big topic of the that discussion. I yeah. really enjoyed that talk, by the way. Yeah, um, bright girl, uh, really interesting perspective, and um, so. But Uvalde was like a big part of like how do we control you know, firearms, et cetera. Yeah. And, uh, and she knew, you know, she knew her history about the second amendment and what it, you know, its purpose and all that. I mean, I would hope so in law school having just finished law school, but, um, <laughs> it seems to me that law school is really about how to evade the law more than how to, yeah. how to actually, where it actually came it. from yeah. and that <laughs> yeah. type of thing. Yeah. Um, is particularly constitutional law. It's like how how do we uh, sidestep the constitution? <laughs> how do we get to around this things? annoying thing yeah. that stands in our way? <laughs> um, so her big sticking point, um, which is often the big sticking point when you get into, uh, because I think most people agree that people should be able to defend themselves. Yeah. Um, the her big sticking point was how do you prevent these kinds of events? Yeah. And um, and there's no answer to that. Like, well, right. actually, the answer is you can't. Well, the 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 real answer is no. There's there's you're all if as long as we have crazy people in the world, mm-hmm. you're gonna have problems like this. Now there are things that can be done to help. Yeah. Um, and I think we're we, we're gonna talk about some of that. Mm-hmm. But the the truth of the matter is the only you can never stop crazy people from being crazy. And the truth yeah. is, is if the government did go around and round up everybody's guns and take them away from everybody. Crazy people would still create create acts of terror. Yeah, the gun. I remember isn't. in London they were uh, legislating how sharp your knives could be. Yeah, yeah. So it becomes a question of where do you want to draw the line. Um, mm-hmm. and, and when it comes to me, I don't want to draw it anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, and yeah, I I think I, my answer to her was that the answer is more freedom, not less. Yeah. yeah. Um, which I think is the answer to most issues that come up, but. Um, specifically with guns, uh, if you're worried about school shootings, then I think the answer is to make them no longer gun free zones Yeah. because when they weren't gun free zones, we didn't have, didn't have shootings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean like when I was, when I was a kid, um, in public school, it was before they were gun free zones and 
you know, this is, I mean, this is not exactly a rural area, but it's more rural than a lot of places. Yeah. Um, and especially I mean, it's, it's when not we... not a big city. Yeah. When we were, you more than me, but because yeah. you were coming up before I was, but not yeah. by much. Oh, this place, had ex- this area had exploded, though, by that time. Yeah. Like, but it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't what it is now. No, though. that's true. Um, but there was a real downtown, and uh, yeah. and certainly I mean, Mobile was. was uh, oh, Mobile was, was the second largest city in the in yeah. the state. Oh yeah, I think it still is. Um, and uh, that's fair. You know, it, and we're we're we are the suburb of Mobile. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Here and where we are, because we're we're the we're the city at the other end of the of the bay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> on the other side of the bay, yeah. and. Uh, the like you could walk through the parking lot most days at school and find hundred guns easily easily yeah. yeah yeah i mean people had them uh, rifles and shotguns hung up in their uh, in the back of their trucks the yeah. people went hunting before and after school um there were guns all over the place i mean i remember people putting guns in their locker like after christmas and so forth when they'd got new guns and they would bring them in yeah and they'd like show their friends yeah and put the guns in the lot i mean there were guns all over the place yeah exactly we didn't have a single school shooting not one (laughs) exactly (laughs) and I, i think um if you look back at these shootings, at least the vast majority of them have happened in places that were supposed to be gun free zones. Yeah. And the reason is because you can feel fairly confident. You're not going to be interrupted. Yeah. Yeah. Like you're going to get a good window. Yeah. For the guy toting the gun that's out there trying to do some damage. Yeah. That's a good place to go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I I think that the answer is to just like loosen up those restrictions. Yeah. Um, and the main thing uh, and we've talked about it before on this podcast, but the main thing is to just allow teachers to carry guns. Yeah. Don't mandate it. Don't and that, prohibit it. That's just where allow I stand it. on it as well. And I know we've talked about it before, but that's, that is the answer is mm-hmm. not, you don't need to mandate it. You don't need to force it down anybody's throat. Just let the teachers who are interested in conceal mm-hmm. carrying a gun. And I do think they should carry it concealed. Yeah. Um, and and I I'm not a big advocate for open carry anyway. I think you should have the right to open carry. Yeah, and but, pass whatever requirements in their state. We're not advocating yeah. anybody do anything illegal. Yeah, here, but, exactly. But that should yeah. be that should if you want to if you truly want to look at ways to prevent things like this from happening. It, this the, these are the real answers. Like that's what's gonna. It, it's never gonna be perfect. Um, mm-hmm. but it gets it gets you a step closer. Yeah. Um. It. it it represents more risk to somebody who's trying to do harm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and again, that won't stop it to you. Like you, if you've got people that are willing, if you've got people that are willing to sacrifice their own life, you can't really stop them. Yeah. Well, and I mean, the, the other thing is we need a culture change in this country. Mm-hmm. Um, well, the, yeah, I mean, that's certainly something that, oh man, could we spend an entire yeah, I, I know. I just kind of opened like, up a can of worms um, there, so I don't want to go. Done. Yeah, um, I mean, but a you know a huge part of it would be okay. So uh, I, I think a lot of the things that we go back to all the time, the kind of things that you were talking about that we should like have focus episodes on or yeah. whatever. Um, you know, the Federal Reserve, uh, the war state. Yeah. Um, these are things that that have an impact on this. Oh yeah, um, and I, I can't remember. There's, I can't. It might even have been me that said it, but I'm pretty sure I got this from somewhere else. Yeah. Um, that says you cannot maintain a moral culture in a state of constant war. Yeah, absolutely. And we've been in a state of constant war since, well, almost since our founding, but yeah. um, certainly since the big since we entered World War II. Yeah. Uh, I mean, constant state of war since then. That's that's yeah. been uh, you know seventy plus years. Yeah. I mean, that has an impact. I mean, and, it has to. Yeah. And then, of course, the Federal Reserve, just the continuing devaluation of money here, just the the economic pressures that are put on, on people um, is a part of it. Uh, if you don't see a chance to succeed in your life, yeah, then, then you become desperate. Yeah. Um, and if you don't see a purpose, and I, I think the government has done done a lot to, like, take away – and I'm going to do this from a like I guess a misogynistic perspective, but to take away a man's purpose. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
And well, I mean, that's not to the... exclude women, but this is something that I understand. Yeah. You know, um, in, in terms of uh, being a protector, being a, a you know, provider, provider et cetera. Like, this is something that the government has, uh, through its actions, maybe intentionally, maybe, maybe not. I think some of them have been intentional, but um, has uh, just kind of chiseled away at over the years yeah. and made it harder for a, a person to f- to have pride in their lives and to feel like they're they're doing what they are supposed to do yeah absolutely um and you know so you, t- you talk about the mental health aspects of this uh, and that's a huge part of it and and yeah. from the studies that I've seen actually um, mental health is like the biggest issue uh, that comes up it it cuts across um, political, uh, lines and um, and uh, ideolo- ideological lines and so forth. Um, that the the biggest issue that comes up consistently in these kind of shootings is mental health problems. Yeah, yeah, and I mean it makes sense. I mean mm-hmm. it it takes a crazy person to do something yeah. crazy, you know. Now you won't get that out of the news though because they want to. Well, they have an agenda. You, yeah, they want to blame some ide- ideology or another. Well, for it. and they mm-hmm. want to push for something that can tangible that they can do. Yeah. To make it, ex- and this goes for. It doesn't require like rolling back government. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> an expansion of government because that's always the goal of governments to expand, expand, expand. And this is um, a, a way for them to do that. Something else I don't think that, that I think we should not, that we need to mention in all of this is that the, the response by the Uvalde Police Department. Oh, yeah. During this, because that's something else, because that's something that I hear come up a lot is, mm-hmm. well, we need to put police in schools. We need to put police in schools. Mm-hmm. And and that's not something I've been particularly against. I'm not a big fan of it. I don't I think it in the end, it does a lot more harm than good. I agree. But I've been open to it because, like, mm-hmm. I mean, I do think that, that there there's there's a reason to have that argument. But that's been torn apart pretty good after this incident. Yeah, um, I, I actually had this discussion with my mom the other night. Yeah. Um. Because she was talking about some of the stuff in this bill that's probably going to pass. Yeah. Um. And uh, one of the things was like more funding for uh, security and resource schools, officers, uh, resource officers, that, that and type support. of thing. Um. And I said that won't make any difference. No. And and, and, and she said, "Why not?" I was like, "Because there's those people have been there. Yeah. For yeah. these things. Yeah. I mean, this is. This, I mean, think about Parkland. That guy just. Hit in the parking lot. Yeah, that guy just hit in the parking lot. And this one was even worse than that, where they were actually physically preventing people from going in that mm-hmm. wanted to. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's just, it's unconscionable that you could have a gang of police officers in a parking lot or mm-hmm. in this, on the property not going in. Yeah. And, well, and, and that's what I said to her. I was like, in this case, you had a SWAT team there. Yeah. Yeah. That didn't do anything. That didn't go in. <laughs> like, you can't ask for better security, you no. know, better jackbooted thugs than that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And they did. They still did nothing. They still did nothing. So because, and, and that goes back to another theme of this podcast, which is because there's a whole, they're a whole lot more interested in protecting themselves than protecting you. Absolutely. I mean, not the individual officers. I don't mean to disparage, yeah. but the system itself. The system itself. Well, and in this, that particular situation, I mean, a lot of them were under order not to go in mm-hmm. I mean that's you know I mean and it's easy to blame the officer because I'm because I, I do by the way like yeah. I mean I don't care what your orders are right it's right and wrong is wrong mm-hmm. and life's too short to 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 be on the wrong end of that yeah you know fire me I'm gonna go do what I know is right yeah and I believe that in my current job and anything I do in life like, and uh, my understanding and I could be wrong about this is that um in the end the it was breaking orders, like disobeying orders that ended this. Yeah. I'm yeah, exactly. So, so it's, it, but it's just, it's a shame. So that the argument of put with more resource officers and more cops in schools that just, I, I'm, I was on the fence about it before and wasn't a big fan of it, mm-hmm. but I'm over it now. Yeah. Like compl- this, this one did it for me completely on that. Like, and, and I don't want our schools to be prisons. Yeah. Because that well, and that was that's something that we've talked about before too. When I uh, saw that uh, school resource officer with his two guns <laughs> and his uh, yeah, right? his handcuffs and his taser and like all that stuff, yeah, oh, like you know, this is not the officer friendly that no. <laughs> <laughs> that I think that you would want in schools if yeah. you wanted officers in schools at all. Exactly, and if uh, that that's another thing that I've uh, like I say, if we do have them in there, they I'm not saying they shouldn't have a gun, but they don't need to be that. Mounted up. Yeah. They don't <laughs> you know? need to look like a soldier exactly. that took his flak jacket off. Exactly. 
Exactly. So, but I'm over that at this point. I, I don't think that I don't think we need police in schools at all. Yeah. I'm I'm I think that I think what we proposed at the beginning is the right answer. You mm-hmm. just do away with the gun free zone completely. Mm-hmm. Let let t- uh, teachers that want to carry in the school do so. Yeah. Um, and that 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 will help. Like I mean, it's not it's not a perfect solution. You'll mm-hmm. never have that. But I think it's better than what we have. Yeah. Um. Now, a question about like discouraging students from having guns. Like, I <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would go as far. I don't think not allowed in the building. I would. I'd let them keep them in their vehicles. Yeah. I think. I think that's a fair middle ground there. Mm-hmm. Um. I because I, I I don't think you need a bunch of teenagers running around in schools with guns. No, and I know. I, I know that that's you know you've said that that was the norm for a while, and I mm-hmm. you know well the, we're also again different strokes for different folks. Yeah. I mean, like inner city schools and so forth, I don't think that they, they don't that have a be good reason. Yeah, that wouldn't be for, appropriate. Um, yeah. Except for protection, honestly. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, here, again, you know, people would go hunting before and after school and yeah. things like that. So, Well, in the tradition of having a gun in the gun rack in the car, I mean, that's, yeah. that's something down here. That means something, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah, it does. Um, I'm not, not sure what exactly. I don't know what either, but it, but it's not to be discounted because no. it because it is important. It is something that's you know important yeah. to us down here. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So, um, well, what else? Um, I don't know. You got any more on Uvalde? I mean, that uh, was... n- no, not specifically Uvalde. I've got a clip from Biden um, from Biden's speech about what he wanted to do oh that's right yeah we should definitely play that all right it's always fun to listen to old biden oh i goodness <laughs> man and this is uh, this is pretty heavily cut up uh so who knows what kind of fun we missed yeah uh, right. well it was probably <laughs> 10 minutes longer well yeah <laughs> and, and a whole lot of ums and ands and yeah. anyway um yeah well let's at least start it we may we may break it up a little bit but uh, all right let's let's start at the beginning do it this is not about taking away anyone's guns. It's about vil- not about vilifying gum o- gun owners. I respect the culture and the tradition and the concerns of lawful gun owners. At the same time, the Second Amendment, like all other rights, is not absolute. It was Justice Scalia who wrote, and I quote, like most rights, the rights granted by the Second Amendment are not unlimited. and never has been. Okay, so my... First thing, like I hate to even make fun of this guy because it feels bad at some point. But <laughs> right. um, do you think he means uh, like chewing gum owners or like uh, uh, you know denture like? Th- I, I kind of wonder. Yeah. Um, in his gum owners, we, we need to not vilify gum owners. Yes, uh, I agree. Um, but like some of the stuff that he says right there. Um, first off, uh, the idea that um, rights are not absolute. <laughs> no, that's what makes them that, rights. That's, that's the whole point, buddy. <laughs> yeah. The the point is of a right is that it is absolute. Yeah. Um, and he makes this comment about, uh, and we've been over this, um, that the Second Amendment was never um, without restrictions and, and so forth. It's just not true. Yeah, exactly. It's historically not true. And in fact, um, if you, you know, beyond the, like, the reason that the, um, like one of the things that was protected was uh, merchants' rights to have cannons. That you know he yeah. brought up specifically one time that you couldn't have a cannon. Well, yeah, absolutely, yeah, you, you could. You could actually, as um, a matter of fact, yeah, <clears throat> to defend yourself against piracy because you couldn't count on the government to do that. And yeah. that's still the case now, as we just discussed. Yeah. Like the whole point is to be able to defend yourself. Yeah. Specifically, actually, against the government, but yeah. the the right of being able to defend yourself is is. An absolute. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and uh, but just for another uh, another example, um, the National Firearms Act, to my knowledge, yeah. the National Firearms Act of 1934 is the first federal firearms restriction. Yeah, I mean I, in 1934. I mean that seems to Constitution stack up. was 1789. Yeah. So we went all that time. Yeah, so more than half of the U.S. history. That, that means that there's only been gun laws for like 85 years. Yeah. Out of our 200 and almost 50 year history now. Yeah. All right, so like the vast majority of the existence of this nation. Yeah. The Second Amendment was absolute. Yeah. Well. And, and here's the other thing that we seem to all keep forgetting about all of the Bill of Rights. Yeah. Is that they aren't restrictions on people. 
Yeah. They're restrictions on the government. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, you know, there's just a, just a bunch of, of BS in that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, the the right is absolute. The right of self defense is absolute. Yeah. Um. And just like all the others. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, I'm a free speech absolutist. <laughs> You're right. And you can say what you want. I don't. Yeah. I'm not saying that there there can't be consequences. Yeah. Uh, you know, going back to the like flag burning thing, right? Yeah. Like if if I burn a flag in front of a, a group of Marines. Yeah, there's consequences to that. There's likely to be consequences, <laughs> and I, you know, yeah. that's the decision that I've made. But yeah. um, the the right itself is absolute. That's what makes it a right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so there's more to this as he goes into what some of the things that he wants to be done, um, many of which are in this uh, upcoming bill. I don't know if we want to play this part or just, like, discuss the the stuff in the bill. Nah, it's up to you. Um, I mean, let's I go ahead and play this part because sure. it's just, I may as well close out the clip and yeah. um, it does, you know, it does mention a lot of the things that we should probably address. All right. We need to ban assault weapons in high capacity magazines. And if we can't ban assault weapons, then we should raise the age to purchase them from 18 to 21. Strengthen background checks, enact safe storage law and red flag laws. Repeal the immunity that protects gun manufacturers from liability. Address the mental health crisis. And actually, it's probably important to mention here that uh, on that Scalia thing, yeah. um, actually, Scalia did specifically, like he referred back to a previous case. Yeah. Um, he's talking about the Heller case, and it refers back to the Miller case. Um, and the the definition of what should be restricted like there was um or maybe i should say what should be allowed yeah. is uh guns that are in common use um for lawful purposes in the US uh-huh. now the thing that they talk about all the time is the AR15 right yeah it is like the most popular rifle in the country yeah that would make it a common use rifle and not subject to restriction. <laughs> it should <laughs> based on what, on the precedent that he's citing. citing. Yeah. Right. Um, now I don't think, you know, I think one of the problems that we have in this country is that, uh, judicial precedent is given too much weight. Yeah. Um, so I don't even, you know, just because the judges made this decision some time ago and the government agrees with it, since um, they're all part of the same system, I don't think is a, a good reason to continue doing something. Not really a, a good moral way. compass. There. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the first off, the assault rifle thing is really poorly defined. Yeah. Um, really, what an assault rifle is, is a semi-automatic rifle that looks mean. Yeah, yeah. The, the scary looking ones, you yeah. know. <laughs> um, high capacity magazines. That's all magazines, not all, but that's most magazines. Well, you know, in Canada... Even, even for pistols. Yeah. Well, you know, in Canada, they um, are uh, planning to pass a law um, that will permanently... Per- this I yeah. get a kick out of this. Permanently restrict magazine size for all weapons to five rounds. Wow. Um, and my question you know, always <laughs> is with this, so the cop's going to be carrying around these oh, five-rounders? Well, that's a good question in and of itself, but uh, the other one is, like, you know that a magazine is just, like, uh, some metal and plastic. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a spring and some plastic, essentially. It's not like yeah. you can't make these things at home into whatever oh. size you want. Yeah, you can uh, probably alter the five-rounders oh, I'm sure you'd be to, to be full round of yeah. full whatever capacity you um, want. So like, the idea that this would do anything is just silly to begin with. Yeah. Um, now, uh, he also talks about um, raising the age to 21. I, again, I don't think this makes any difference, but... Um, but think about the other thing that you've done here is that take somebody who, when they turn 18, they go join the army. Yeah. Now they are almost immediately given an M16 or an M4 rifle. Yeah. Go start shooting brown people. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Halfway around the world. (laughs) Exactly. Um, and they're heavily trained. They fire thousands and thousands and thousands of rounds through this thing over the next couple of years. And so they, they do their tour and they come home. After yeah. two years. They're not 21 yet. Yeah. They can't even own one of these guns. So they spent the last two years with 
this kind of rifle in their hand. Actually, a more a more powerful version. Yeah. yeah. Um, with a full automatic. Yeah. Not that you can't do that yourself again, but at least the restriction here is semi-automatic. Yeah. Um, with a, a full automatic version of this thing right next to them almost constantly for yeah. two years, and they come back here after serving their country yeah. and told they can't own one of these. Well, and the crazy thing about that is, is for once you get into shooting guns and handling guns, like it's therapeutic for a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, it is for me. Like, I'm, mm-hmm. dude, I am so much happier of a person after I've had range day. Yeah. Like, you know, just going out there and shooting guns and doing that, it's, it's very therapeutic, especially for somebody who's in that world. Yeah. So you're talking about somebody who signed up to be in that world mm-hmm. and then came back and now can't be a part of it. Yeah. Again. <laughs> I enjoy the precision of it. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, what sense does what? that make? Yeah, and like it doesn't even make logical sense. Besides the fact that this guy is probably one of the best trained people on that kind of firearm yeah. in the entire world. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so you know that's absurd. Red flag laws. Talk uh, about violating constitutional issues. Yeah. Fifth Amendment is a big one. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it's a pretty important one. Um, that you shouldn't have uh so for those that don't know um because actually this came up with the girl on the plane she didn't know what red flag laws were oh, so really? i got to explain this yeah <clears throat> um these are the uh the laws that say that if somebody reports somebody that they may be a danger um that law enforcement can go take their weapons away until it's assured that they're not a danger yeah essentially so yeah um, like to take the guns early yeah. Uh, <laughs> that one that Trump that said that? <laughs> yeah, he, he was like, yeah. Um, I, well, how did he Take say Take the guns exactly? first or yeah, something, and, yeah. And then do process, do process later. later. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. Well, it's, the problem is that, once again, that sticky little document, the Constitution, gets in the way. Yeah. Um, Innocent until proven guilty. Yeah, and that people can't be deprived of uh, life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Yeah. Yeah. That's property. <laughs> oh, we'll give them due process after we take their guns. <laughs> um, well, and this is another thing that, that Biden and others have said is that, oh, well, you know, the red flag law. What they've actually done with the bill is that they have um, created incentives for the states to create their own red flag laws instead of doing it from a federal level. Yeah. Um, with uh, the statement that, you know, the red flag laws would comply with uh, constitutional requirements. I don't know how. Yeah, there's no way. Well, so, I'll tell you what's the scary thing to me about the red flag law thing is that that what we consider mentally stable ain't what it used to be. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about if you, yeah, there's all kinds of examples of, you know, if you don't think it's like right to have children go into mm-hmm. see uh, the trans Oh yeah, like, the, you like you're not mentally stable. Like you, you <laughs> think that that's not right. Yeah. Like it's it's just what it's not what it used to be. Yeah, that's true. So, um, and you know this, like a lot of things. Do you really want uh, government defining what is a normal person? Well, that's just it. Like the where their definitions are and where the real definitions are are two different places. And they're they're spreading further and further apart. Yeah. Um so it's just something to keep in mind with red flag laws. And I don't know what the safe storage laws are. Is that are they telling me how I need to store my own property? Is that what that's my about? Yes, is that's probably correct, mm. but I but I don't actually know. Yeah. Um I mean, I know I know when you buy a gun, it comes with a safety kit and blah, blah, blah. And I, my assumption is is that certain states have regulations of, you know, you have to use this and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So. Well, I'm pretty sure D.C. has storage requirements um, yeah. that they have to be locked and, you know, et cetera. Which should be interesting. So since <clears throat> our next convention is going to be in D.C., I'm going to have to, like, look into the gun laws in D.C. Like, I never yeah. travel without my weapon. Yeah. Um, but I might have to. I don't know. I, I haven't looked. Oh yeah, because you don't fly anywhere. That's right. Well, yeah, <laughs> it's I, such I, a pain to bring a gun on a plane. That it's, well, that and I think that not I mean, that, can I bring my Alabama carry permit to DC? It's and supposed to be reciprocal, only for certain states. Yeah, well, I said it's supposed to be reciprocal. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
the Constitution. The Constitution should say, <laughs> well, I mean, we in Alabama, we may have constitutional carry by then. I think they mm-hmm. passed it. It just hasn't been implemented yet. So you yeah. won't even need to go get a carry permit. <clears throat> You'll just be able to, as a citizen of the state, carry your gun. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. I have not quite shaken this cough. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I, I'm not sure what the... I'm not sure what issues would come up. Well, I'm gonna have to look into it for. But travel. DC has pretty strict gun laws. I know laws. they do. <laughs> um, on the bright side, probably won't stay in DC. Yeah, <laughs> you don't think so? Get a Airbnb in Virginia or Maryland, and I've had some interesting experiences in Airbnbs this week. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I missed that. Uh, um, you said the place was nice, just was not in the best super area. Nice. <laughs> uh, As is where it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, let's move off this cause I, I've got to stop talking. So. Yeah. I, I know um, you're winding down here as far as your voice. So, but we wanted to talk about the convention some. Yeah. Um, so I, I, you know, I definitely had a good time. Um, it was, it was interesting there were a lot of people that had never been to it. I guess there's always a lot of people that have never been to a convention before, but there were a lot. This one seemed of a little different though. That were, had never been to a convention before. Um, it's always slow. Uh, you know, they're super litigious on this parliamentary stuff because uh, libertarians. <laughs> and um, so I, I remember like at the end of the first session, um, the first half day, we had done essentially nothing. We had yeah. accomplished nothing on the agenda at all. <laughs> And awesome. uh, there were a lot of people that were like, wow, man, is it always like this? And there were a lot of people that were saying, no, no, it's not like this. You know, I said, yeah, it is. Yeah, this is this the, is It is always like this. Um, the difference was uh, it seemed more, um, I don't know, uh, it seemed more contentious. Yeah. Uh, it was definitely more factionalized. Than yeah. it had been in the in the past with the with the rise of the Mises Caucus. Yeah. Now, um, you like me are in a kind of an interesting position uh, vis-a-vis the Mises Caucus and the Libertarian Party. In that, I joined the Mises Caucus as soon as it formed. Yeah. But I was already part of the Libertarian Party. Yeah. Um, and had yeah. been for years. Yeah, absolutely. So, and I don't participate in all the online stuff that goes on with the Mises Caucus and so forth. So while I am a part of this, and I, I've consider myself to be ideologically aligned, I'm still kind of an outsider looking in on the whole thing. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, you know, I don't know. It just seemed very factionalized um, at the beginning where both sides were suspicious of the other side. Yeah. Um, both sides were trying to do some kind of shady stuff, it seemed like, at the beginning. And I, I think at the beginning of the Mises Caucus, uh, like when it first formed and... You had all these people that were so big a part of the liberty movement that were not um, members of the Libertarian Party. Yeah. And then the Mises Caucus was formed, and they said, you know, we're going to make the Libertarian those people in. Yeah, we're going to make yeah. the Libertarian Party Libertarian. Yeah. And I was absolutely on board with that. And I think that there needs to be a new direction for the party because they've had a lot of opportunity. Well, and the big pitch Michael <laughs> Heiss has always made is he wants to bring the Ron Paul revolution into the Libertarian Party to, yeah. to where its home would would likely would should be. Naturally be. Naturally at. be at. Yeah. Um and I think that's a I think that's a good plan. Like mm-hmm. I'm I'm all on board with that because I thought I mean the Ron Paul revolution, I mean that's the biggest push we've seen in a long time. Yeah. And, I mean, and some of the best libertarian voices out there, the Tom Woods and the Scott Horton, I don't want them to feel like they can't be a part of the libertarian party. That doesn't make yeah, any sense at all. No, doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, particularly Scott Horton, of course, is a hero of mine. Yeah. Um, and, the you know, <laughs> I actually, I talked to him briefly at the conference and I mentioned, um, I talked about the interview that we did when we interviewed him yeah. all those years ago. I said, uh, I asked him if he remembered what it was about. And he was like, well, no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, it's, it's almost prescient in a way because I'm a, like a lot of it was about why you weren't a part of the Libertarian Party and what you thought the Libertarian Party needed to do. Yeah, that's true. Um, I forgot about that. Yeah. And um, and that's a lot of the things that the that the Mises Caucus was is promising. It's pushing for. Yeah. 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 Um, Open to do. So, uh, anyway, um, those people do need to be a part of 
the Libertarian Party if we're going to get any kind of change. And they have such big followings that they brought people in. And it was apparent from very early on in the conference that they had the people. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was about two to one. Yeah, wow. Uh, Mises over everybody else. Yeah. Um, or at least, like, people that were would vote with Mises. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, over everybody else. Yeah. Uh, Things went slower than even normal because there were so many people that didn't hadn't been a part well, of this before. Yeah, um, and I there were some mistakes that. that were made. I think uh, on both sides. Now, of course, it seems to me that there was kind of shady stuff before the convention on both sides as well. Like um, there was definitely one. I think two states that arrived with two different delegations. Oh yeah, um, because. Uh, you know, one side or the other had won. Actually, it, I'm pretty sure in each case it was um, Mises had come in and taken over all the officer positions through votes at the convention, at the state convention. Yeah. And then the existing, the status quo uh, of the state rejected the votes and said that that wasn't the real party and formed a new party calling that the real party. Yeah, there was some fights over that. When, um, at the time that I remember hearing about, I'm not in yeah. the weeds with it. But, yeah, me. Either. But it was shady. Massachusetts was one, one of them, them yeah. definitely that was at the convention with two different delegations. I want to say New Hampshire was one too. Might have been. I, but, I, I I, but I don't know. But I remember um, when these fights were going on at the state level. Yeah, I don't pay any attention to this stuff. See, we didn't have this kind of problem in our state. Yeah, Mises never really even came up. Yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, about a third of our delegation was were uh, Mises Caucus members. Yeah, um, about half of our delegation essentially voted with the Mises group on uh, yeah. so ideologically aligned. Yeah, um, but I know at the our state convention, like there wasn't a lot of talk of that. Like, yeah. the, I mean, I don't know that. And the it Mises really Institute is in our state. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so, and actually, that's something that's always frustrated me because before this, I was always annoyed at why the Mises people weren't more involved in the Alabama party since they're here. Yeah. Right. It's true. Um, but at at any rate, uh, you know, you saw some of the stuff that you see at conventions where, you know, uh, groups that are, it seems to me that groups that are ideologically aligned don't need somebody telling them what to do. Yeah, they should just know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like when a vote comes up, if you're ideologically aligned, you shouldn't have to have somebody tell you whether you're supposed to vote yes or no yeah. on this thing. Um, I mean, but that was going on, uh, you know, big block voting that way. Yeah. I guess I don't, especially if you're new to it, like it a lot of that, yeah. yeah. Um, but you should be able to lean over to your delegation chair and say, wait, so what's going on here? If I vote yes, what happens? If I vote no, what happens? And yeah. be able to make your decision that way. So um, I don't know. That kind of stuff annoyed me, especially for a group that like definitely considers themselves to be the more radical independent libertarian, you know, <laughs> right. I, don't know. Um, I thought, I thought it was odd. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, like once, well, okay, let me go back to the messaging. Cause I think that there were some mistakes made at the beginning of the Mises caucuses were, you know, we're going to make the libertarian party libertarian again. And then you had some of these, um, big fights within state parties, uh, where people were being excluded uh, purposely excluded and so forth. And um, it shifted from we're going to make the Libertarian Party Libertarian again to we're taking this bitch over. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that that was a mistake. Uh, I think that that was bad messaging, it, it, especially yeah. when you're talking about a bunch of libertarians. Like yeah, we they, don't want to exactly be taken over. Yeah. Even if I do agree with you. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And um, so I, I, th I think that that was a big error, and I think it, that it was an error that one of the first things that, the, um, that they tried to do at the convention was to remove the sitting chair. Yeah. Um, I, I think that that just created a bad— More tension. Yeah. Unnecessarily. Um, it didn't happen. Yeah. Um, I voted against it. I thought that she was doing a fine job. Yeah. And— um, Would know. continue to? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as it turned out— um, she ended up getting really sick and wasn't there the the following day. And uh, do you remember um, the uh, guy that chaired our conference, our state conference, yeah. a couple of years ago, uh, Molman? Yeah, Molman. He he yeah. He I saw some pictures just, of him doing it. Yeah, he was awesome. Yeah, fantastic. He's, yeah, he's good. Um, so yeah, he was he was entertaining and charismatic and um, and kept good control over things, all things considered. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, 
you know, and some contentious votes that weren't really, that turned out not to be that contentious. Um, he allowed uh, disputes that he probably shouldn't have to prove a point. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I appreciated that. Like at first I was annoyed and then I thought, well, you know, this will probably take less time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, any, nobody can come back later and say yeah. anything. Um, yeah. So specifically the, the vote about the uh, abortion plank being removed. Yeah. Um, he, you know, made a judgment. It required, I think it required a simple majority. Yeah. And it was very clear that a majority of the room voted a particular way. Yeah. Um, but people disputed anyway. Yeah. And, uh, you know, then there were the accusations that they were being dilatory. And he was like, look, it'll just take less time if we just do the hand count. Yeah. All right. We'll do the hand count now. We'll prove the point. And then next time this comes up. Yeah. Then I'll rule it dilatory and we'll just move, move right on. on. Yeah. And uh, the count came up to... It was almost 80% to 20%. Wow. Yeah. It was like 78% of the room voted a particular way. It was very obvious <laughs> that it was a majority. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I liked that he did that yeah. um, in, in the end, even though I was kind of annoyed at first. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, once the officers were elected, and that was something that they did also, is that they rearranged um, the schedule. Got a cat that really wants in here. Yeah. Um, rearranged the agenda to do officer elections first. Uh, I think that there was a good reason for Like, people were upset about that, but if you remember what happened in 2020, um, there was delays and delays and delays and delays. Um, and uh, it seemed to me, and I, I discussed this with some people that up there that disagree with me on this, but it seemed to me that um, uh, the, the, the sitting chair at that time um, was trying to prevent officer elections from happening within the the time limits of the convention yeah. uh, so that the board could select officers. Yeah, um, we don't want that. And that would just maintain <laughs> the status quo. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so and nobody should want that, by the no, way. exactly. Like, the people of the party should vote for the leadership. Yeah, like, even if they're new people. Yeah, agreed. Even more so if they're new people. Maybe not even more so. But, they, I mean, they have a voice, too. Yeah, you know, um, they're involved now. Yeah, exactly. Right. So uh, they did move the officer elections up to be the first thing that happened. Um, once officer elections happened and the Mises caucus dominated, yeah. like they won every Swept position. It. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, I thought things became better after that. Um, yeah. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of talk of, of um, there was a lot of conciliatory talk yeah. after that about, okay, uh, what's done is done. Yeah. Um, here you are. Remember that our enemies are not each other. Yeah, they're they're, they're outside out there. this room. Yeah. This is it's the state that's our enemies, and that's what always annoys me, especially about the when we get down into the weeds with a lot of the stuff at these conventions. It's mm -hmm. like, man, like we're so far from where we want to be as far as like convincing the country that we're right. Yeah. Why are we fighting with ourselves, man? And we're so lar largely ideologically aligned. Yeah, I mean, we got to look at the big picture, which is the reason. I mean, reason the argument here was uh, about the direction that the party should take, yeah. not about our philosophy or anything. It was just yeah. about how how, how do we, we want to package go, it. Yeah, how do we go about getting more people on board? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I I think that the change needed to be made. Yeah. Because the well, parties I've, had a lot of time, like the status quo has had a lot of time to make some changes, and they they'll you know they have things they tout. Yeah, there there will be the <laughs> well, we got more uh, votes than ever before at Gary Johnson in 2016. Yeah. Like, yeah, you did. Look but at the you, two candidates. Yeah, you were running against the two most hated candidates in the history of the country. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you only pulled three percent of the vote. I think I think that if they well, and, if they and had Gary a Johnson's good goal was to get five because his yeah, thing was give right. me five, give me five. Yeah, um, and he couldn't even get to that. Mm -hmm. And with the two worst candidates there's ever been. Yeah, and and I, I I agree with where you're going here. I think if we had had a princi a strong principled candidate that could deliver the message that well. was a good deliverer, we could have mm -hmm. got five because he did not manage a, an no. antagonistic media very well. Exactly. Um, and I I, I think that. I think that less than ten percent in that election was a failure. Yeah, no, I personally. agree. Yeah, um, that that should have been a real jumping off point for the Libertarian Party, and instead yeah. we presented these two milk toast guys. Yep. Um, 
and one of whom actually endorsed Hillary endorsed Clinton. Endorsed Hillary Clinton <laughs> during the campaign. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. can't have that. That was a that was a disaster. And 2020 was just as bad. You had the candidate up there that just. There, with there was everything busy talking about Black Lives Matter instead yeah. of the thing that really affected everybody in yeah. the country, the, the lockdowns the, and the, the mandates. The thing that we're good on, one yeah. of the best things that we could have, I mean, that was, you couldn't have written our messaging any better. Yeah. I mean, it, there was, it was all right there in front of and you. Think, and to not take advantage of yeah. that. And even something that may not have, have won her a lot of votes at the time, think if she had just spent time talking about the Fed and money creation and how this oh, was yeah. going to lead to an inflation disaster in the future. Oh, how much man. how much credit would that have gotten us by this now? Point? Yeah, exactly. And and we knew all of that in real time. Yeah. Like it's not like there weren't people in our movement that was that saw what was coming. Dude, printing all this money is going to be a problem in a couple of years. Yeah. Well, it's been a couple of years. <laughs> yeah. And it's a problem. It, it, I, I don't think anybody would argue that it's not a problem. Not yeah. anybody sane. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, we're, we're largely ideologically aligned, even though there's all this infighting. Well, and like I said, I, that kind of ended after the officers were elected. There was a whole lot of, all right, well, now you've got it. Show what us what do? you can do. Yeah. Well, good. And so let's, you know, let's see. Um, now <laughs> I, I keep saying we're largely ideologically aligned. My mom was like, well, it doesn't sound like it. Cause you had this big abortion debate. Yeah. And uh, and that was like Which the other won big by piece like of business. Eighty percent, by the way. Yeah. According to you. Yeah. 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 Um, the and this is what I told her. I was like, this isn't an ideological issue. This is a semantic, yeah. a semantic issue within the Libertarian Party. Yeah. Because one side is is saying that a fetus is not a life. It's not an independent life, and they're making an argument for bodily autonomy. Yeah. Um, that uh, that stemming from the right to life, you own yourself. And are in control of your own body. Yeah. All right. Um, that's the same argument that the other side's making. The difference is they define the fetus as being a, an independent life. Yeah. That's the difference. Yeah. Um, so, like, if you talked about bodily autonomy and the right to life and self-ownership and so forth with either side of this group, they would tell you the same thing. Yeah. All right. <laughs> right. The, the difference is what... What, whether they think the fetus is an independent life or not. Yeah. Um, which I think is largely the question between most people in this country. Yeah. Um, that, you know, the debate on abortion is really about that, I think. Yeah. Um, now, uh, the plank, I think we read it beforehand, but it, essentially it said um, that this is a, a nuanced issue with a lot of passion and people have good faith arguments on both sides. And because people have good faith arguments on both sides, uh, the Libertarian Party doesn't think that it should be a government question, yeah. um, that it should be left to each person in their own conscience. Yeah. Right? Um, now, that is Which, essentially my political position. And and as a pro-life person, and I do consider myself pro-life, I didn't have a problem with that. Yeah. Like, And I, I gathered after this vote was made, because I was in a bunch of the online discussions, mm -hmm. um, People do. <laughs> like yeah. pro-life people well, have a problem with it. This, the reason that you don't have a problem with it at this point, and I think yeah. that you probably would have two years ago Maybe. Um, if you'd have really thought about it, but I, the, I think the reason that you don't have a problem with it at this point is because now you consider yourself an anarchist. So you don't want yeah. the government involved in anything. Well, that's probably true. You know, you make and, a good point there. I didn't really look at it that way, but I think you're right, actually. Yeah. Um, because I think that that position that that plank said is the only position for an anarchist to take. Yeah. Because you don't want the government involved in defining life. Yeah. Yeah, oh, absolutely. You don't want the government yeah. involved in anything. You don't want government. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so you can't leave it to government. Yeah. Uh, you, so the only option is that you take it out of the hands of government, which is what the plank said. Yeah. Um, that being said, though, there are a whole lot of libertarians that are not anarchists. Yeah. I, and, I learned that. Even in the Mises groups. Oh, because, I'm like, sure that that's the, true. The Mises people were the spearhead in taking this out. That's true. Um, so if you... And, and this is... Um, and this is how I tried to think about it from other people's perspective. And I thought, if you are a minarchist or, or somebody that believes in government yeah. as a libertarian, probably the most important thing that you think that government should do is protect life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, life, liberty, and property. Yep. 
Um, and that that's his only role, in fact, is to protect <laughs> right. life, liberty, <laughs> and property. Yeah. Um, depending on how much of a... Minor, how far how, down yeah. the pipeline you <laughs> yeah, are. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if you are a minarchist and you believe that the fetus is an independent life, the plank essentially takes the question out and says that you the that the libertarian party is pro choice up to the moment of birth. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what that plank really said even by saying even though, that we don't want government involved in the decision yeah. by default it becomes a pro choice decision all the way up to the moment of birth. And so if you believe in government and you believe the government's role is to protect life, liberty and property, yeah. then this is antithetical to what you believe as a libertarian. Yeah. Um and so because of that, even though the plank itself was essentially my position on – my political position on the issue, yeah. I voted to have it removed yeah. because here's another really important libertarian thing. Yeah. It is not my place to impose my beliefs about this on others. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and especially to me, this just – of all the issues we need to be focused on and talking about, this just isn't it. Yeah. I mean, that that's really my thing as far as this issue. And if this issue is really in it, the, the things I saw online, this issue was holding a lot of people out of the party. Yeah. Um, well, and, and it, people it's that an I issue think, that when you take away the plank. So I, I did have concerns about, okay, so now if we don't have a stance on abortion. Yeah. But... But the truth is the only people that read the platform are libertarians. And that yeah. actually goes for the Republican and the Democrat platforms too. Oh, the yeah. only people that read the libertarian, the Republican, the Democrat, the Green Party platform, those are all libertarians. They're the only yeah. people that read those <laughs> yeah, things. Right. Right? So um, if, if you go through there and you say, well, they, they don't have a stance on abortion, what does that do for us? Um, and I, 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 you know, I think it, it is partially a detriment that we didn't take a stand on it. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it gives the opportunity to discuss it with the nuance it deserves. Yeah. And that gives your candidates that opportunity that they're not being pressed on a plank in mm -hmm. their, in their party. Um, yeah. and like I said, the response I saw online, a lot of people were really happy about that. And a lot of people that at least say they weren't involved or willing to be involved now. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, I think in the end it should be a, a positive move yeah. for the party. Um, and I, I do want to emphasize once again uh, the reason that I made the decision that I made to vote to remove the plank um, is something that I think is fundamental to libertarianism, which is that it is not our place to enforce through government or any other means, yeah. our positions on others. Yeah. It's not our place to impose our beliefs on others. As yeah. long as you're not hurting me, then you can make your own decisions about your life. Do what you want to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I'm excited about the future of the party going mm -hmm. forward. Uh, I, I feel like for a long time now, I've always been hesitant on pulling people towards the party and pushing the people to the party mm -hmm. because I, I just didn't feel like it fully represented where I was at. And yeah. I've thought that way for a long time. I mean, um, I mean, I voted for Harry Brown and I thought he represented a party that I was proud of. Yeah. That was the first president I ever voted for. Me too, actually, mm -hmm. uh, was Harry Brown. Um, and I, I do feel like he represented, I had represented what I wanted, but yeah, I really love that guy. Since go look up Harry Brown on uh, YouTube oh, people dude. and just listen to him. Amazing. Yeah, talk like, to talk yeah. about this stuff. It's yeah, he really he'll get great. you where you want to go. Yeah. <laughs> he'll get you where I want you to go. <laughs> yeah. Um, but since then, I I can't really say that I've had a lot of pride in the party. Mm -hmm. I think going forward, that's going to change. Now I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but if the but if Michael Heiss has done what he set out to do and brought the Ron Paul energy into this movement, I think it's going to be a force to be reckoned with. And I think that it's gonna. It's definitely something that I would take pride in bringing people on board to. Yeah. Um, we'll see. Like I said, we don't know yet. Yeah, this could be an utter failure. This it, this could be terrible, but but I don't think so. Uh, I'm excited to see what happens over the next two years, and I'm excited to see what happens um, if we can bring a candidate with the with the charisma and the messaging 
and the 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 kind of radical messaging that I think people need now. Yeah. Um, I actually talked to Joe Jorgensen while I was there oh, for you? a little bit ab- yeah. about messaging. Yeah. Um, she showed up to the uh, the whiskey caucus um, whiskey event, yeah. which I didn't know this existed. I'm definitely joining this caucus also. <laughs> right. Um, but she came in. I, actually, I think it was mostly the radical caucus that that actually put it on. But yeah. anyway, um, she came in towards the end and sat down and had a drink. And was just, there was only about uh, maybe a dozen people in the room, probably not even at yeah. that point. Um, and I, I talked to her some about messaging because one of the things she was saying, her concerns about the Mises caucus taking over yeah. is talking about radical messaging. And she was like, we've tried this, yeah. you know, we tried this back in the eighties and like it, or nineties yeah. or, or whatever. And it just, it didn't work. It didn't resonate with people. Yeah. And I, I told her, I was like, but times have changed. Yeah. Well, like you're talking about changed as, and media has changed. That's also true. But I, I think like, especially late eighties, nineties, People like the country ready was going that. pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Like especially the nineties, man. Yeah, like the nineties. That was one big party, man. I miss the nineties. Yeah. <laughs> people, you know, the idea of like radically changing things then when things seemed to be going really well is probably not, a, a, not an appealing time. message to people. Yeah. But now most people don't think that things are going in the right direction. No, nope. they're looking for something else. Yeah, and and giving them an option that is radically different, I think, can be far more effective now than it was then. Yeah, and radically radically different in a way that. And she conceded that I may be right. Um. Well, and hey, nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, and radically different in a way that is kind of based on the founding principles of the country. Yeah. Like, I mean, what we want is radical, but it's not unheard of. Yeah. Uh, Especially at the beginning. Like now, granted what me and you want may be a little more radical than, than what's, you know, what your average American wants. But but it's, it's radical to the point that, you know, they, when things are, like you said, when things are the way they are right now, people start, taking those arguments on and are mm-hmm. more open to them. Yeah. Um, and it's, and it's not like it's without precedent because this country was founded on the idea of freedom. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, it's, that's, I mean, we take a lot of pride in that even today, even though we're not one of the freest countries mm-hmm. in the world, we still tout it. Yeah. This is, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah. Man. R- running All out right. of gas. <laughs> yeah. All right. This is, this is my last little thing. We'll wrap it up. All right. Um, I was listening to a guy, a foreigner, actually, a um, uh, Dutch uh, guy, who was talking about um, how, and he's been commenting on this kind of thing over the last couple of years, and he was, I think in this particular uh, case, he was commenting on some of the Ukraine stuff, but um, he was saying that he's a, you know, he's a big believer in freedom. Yeah. Um, and that uh, that he thinks that the... Um, the constitution is one of the, you know, is like this fantastic document and how wonderful it is and so forth. Yeah. And, um, I didn't actually go in and make the comment. Uh, this is on YouTube. Um, I didn't actually go in and make the comment. I may yet, honestly. Um, but I wanted to say to him, I was like, first off, it's not the constitution you love. Yeah. Um, bill of rights, maybe. Yeah. Uh, but it's not the constitution you love. What you're talking about, like that ideal is embodied in the Declaration of Independence, yeah. not in the Constitution. Yeah. Um, now, it codifies some of that stuff in the Bill of Rights, but it's really the Declaration of Independence, I think, that is the thing that you're in love with. Yeah. Um, and I am too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but, um, and then I was going to quote Spooner, which I, I can't quote exactly <laughs> yeah. um, right now without it right in front of me. I was going to go pull out the book, but... Um, Spooner said in, uh, it was either in No Treason or uh, Constitution of No Consent or one of those anyway. Um, he says something along the lines, he closes uh, with something along the lines of um, the Constitution may be one thing or it may be another, but what we have seen is that it is has either the, uh, it is either um, permitted the type of government that we have or has been unable to prevent it. Yeah. And either way, it has no reason to exist. Yeah. 
and people get really irritated with me when because I say that a lot. Especially, mm-hmm. man, the worst thing you can say to me is the Constitution, blah blah blah. Because guess what? That's nothing but a piece of paper, buddy. Yeah, like it, it does, takes people to defend it. Yeah, exactly. And we haven't done that. And we haven't. So don't don't come at me with what the Constitution says because I, there really is no sense in us even having it anymore. Yeah, because we don't follow it. In any way, shape, or form, mm-hmm. um, it's that's a whole nother podcast, right there. We like tip the hat, but that's, that's really it. it. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I um, I'm about to go in a serious coughing fit, so <laughs> well, let's wrap it up. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, we yeah we're back. Um, we're gonna record again later this week. I hope so. That's definitely the plan. Okay. Yeah. We're we're hoping to record again later this week. Sorry for the long delay. We have really terrible timing on this stuff. Yeah. Um, well, I you mean, know, Tom Woods mentioned our podcast on his podcast, and that was like right at the time that my dad died, and we didn't record <laughs> for like three weeks. Yeah. And then, you know, I was out there talking with people at, at the convention and, um, you know, passing our name around and, and promoting us as best I could yeah. uh, whenever opportunity arose. And then we didn't record. And then you come back sick. (laughs) So So I I hate that this keeps happening this way, but, um, you know, we have 130 something episodes. So hopefully if you're, if you're definitely a content library, yeah, you found some things that made you at least stick around long enough to listen to this new one. Yeah. And we'll try and be more consistent again going forward. I don't plan on getting coronavirus again anytime soon. And so. if you do, you already got an immunity, so it would be even weaker than it was I, this time. Yeah, if I get it, I will prove that I do not have immunity. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so we, we're planning to be back later this week, and then we'll be back on to a normal schedule, um, hopefully at least through the summer, and uh, we'll see where we are from there. from there. I mean, no matter what, we're not planning on stopping this thing anytime oh, soon. Oh, yeah, no, we're here. So, um, oh, you know, if you're, if you're new, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'm... Glad that you're here. Um, if you're old, I'm really sorry that we kept you waiting for so <laughs> long, but um, we're back. Absolutely. All right. So, uh, yeah, we'll be back later this week, hopefully. Um, follow us on Facebook. Uh, you can subscribe on iTunes, Podbean, or YouTube. Uh, like and share, um, you know, comment. Uh, you can always email me, uh, michael at the liberty mike.com. Um, I'm, you know, happy to hear any comments or questions, or if you have some media that you want me to look at also, uh, you know, like articles or whatever, um, I can't see everything. So I always appreciate that stuff too. And, um, yeah, and we'll be back later this week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Later.